On today's show, the NBA has a new schedule rest policy. How does it impact the Cavs? Is it good? Let's talk about it. You are Locked On Cavs, your daily Cleveland Cavaliers podcast. The music you heard on the way in is from our friends at Astral Radio. I'm Chris Manning. That is Evan Damrell. Thanks again to Jake Stevens, as always, for his work on production. Today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel Sportsbook, official sportsbook of Locked On. Make every moment more. Right now, new customers can bet $5 and they get 200 in bonus bets guaranteed. Visit FanDuel.com slash Locked On to get started. Today is going to be all about the new... NBA rest policy. This is something that, if you hear what Adam Silver has had to say, is very much pushing back, trying to get the league back to guys playing 82 games or something close to it. To start, the the Cavs will have some players affected. This isn't going to affect every player. I mean, not frankly, to be very blunt about it, not every player in the league uh, has the same Cachet, same importance as... Oh, contraire, my friend. Ben Simmons is on this list. Okay, but like Ben Simmons is... Ben Simmons like has made an all-star team and was once like an all-NBA caliber defensive player of the year calendar guy. And like, no offense to like Isaac Okoro. No one's going to care if he like rests a game. Teams have to manage their roster to ensure that no more than one star player, quote star player, is... Unavailable for the game unless injuries are real. The star players have to be available for nationally televised and in-season tournament games, and they must refrain from any long-term shutdowns to stop star players from participating in games. Um, the Cleveland Cavaliers have a couple players here on this list: Darius Garland, um, Evan, uh, Jared Allen, and Donovan Mitchell have all received. Star player designation. The way it works is if they have been selected to an All NBA team or an NBA All Star team in each of the previous three seasons, and if anyone makes an All Star team during the season but it wasn't one that wasn't on these list, let's say Evan Mobley makes the All Star team, he then becomes subject to the list. But I got to tell you, um, I think there are certain teams this is going to be a pain in the butt to deal for. The Clippers come to mind. The Thunder come to mind. I think if I kind of have a read on JB Bickerstaff. I don't really know if this is going to be something that if I feel like this is going to make him happy. I think it's going to make him happy in the sense that um, it's now mandated. At least it's like a required rule for teams. Um, uh, For quick reference, as Chris and I were discussing this, as I pitched an idea of how it impacts Cleveland's opponents, um, only 25 of the 30 teams have this designation. Um, Orlando not being one of them. Um, insert X, Y, and Z team here. Like the the, the tri- like to your point, like this list could change a bit. Like Pascal Siakam could be traded from Toronto. Toronto's removed from this list. Uh, the Portland Trailblazers could send Damian Lillard to Orlando, and then Orlando joins this list, and then Portland leaves this list. Um, the Charlotte Hornets are objectively going to be one of the worst teams in basketball next season, and they are on this list because they have Lamelo Ball on their roster. Um, and it's just like interesting because now if like you're the Denver Nuggets, like Aaron Gordon, Jamal Murray, uh, even Michael Porter Jr., like they can get nights off of rest for national TV games unless there's like a series existing injury well, because Nicole well, Jokic like, is the only guy. Let, but like from let, the lens of the Cavs, yeah, from yeah. the lens of the Cavs, um, JB Pickerstaff has always been an advocate of if you're healthy, you should play. Uh, he's not really a guy who rests his players unless there is just like a scheduled, I want to say scheduled win, but like you think of how the Pistons weren't great last season and the Cavs gave Donovan Mitchell, who was dealing with issues at times last season, whether it was the ankle, the knee or the groin uh, time off against the Pistons or Darius Garland, who um, was dealing with eye, the eye injury or a finger injury or just like aches and pains and knee stuff too. Like there's ways that teams can navigate this, but you really have to put this in the ether sooner. And also, like, it's impossible to think a player is going to be available for all 82 games, especially just with how physical today's game is. But for Baker staff, at least, like, he has to be happy that it's just at least written in stone at this point that you are going to get high-level competition no matter 
who the opponent is. Um, and now that there's like rules in place that so players can't rest guys just at any given night, um, it does make the game of basketball a lot more fun and a lot more competitive, at least through that lens. And I know Bickerstaff would be an advocate of that just based on what he said publicly. I, I think to just hit at the the part of this, the kids, I think if you look at how many games these guys played last year and it was when they missed time, it was due to injury. Like Darius Garland missed time at the beginning of the season because he got poked in the eye. He still played 69 games. Uh, Jared Allen has had injury each of the last few years at various times. He still played 68 games last year and you know would have played more than 56 the year before if not for... I mean, injuries that really der- an injury that really derailed Cleveland's tenure. And if you look at Donovan Mitchell, he played six eight last year, six seven the year before. He's obviously like there's, but there were some bumps and bruises there. But I, it, you know, I don't, I can't speak to how aggressive they are about this. But I, I think you could see Mitchell and Garland and these guys, depending, like play seventy five, eighty games. Like I do think you are just going to see them play more games. And if I had to guess, I also tend to think that the players are probably good with that. I, I don't think if if the reporting we've read and seen about this, it's I think teams are the one driving this. I'm, this is one of those things. I want to see what the what Garland and Mitchell and them say about this because I could just see Mitchell being like, I want to play every night and play eighty games, and there is the sixty five game minimum for awards now. So like, there's all That's... of this. Where it's just I, I do think you're going to see all these guys just play as many games as they possibly can. And I, I think for the Cavs, for a team that should be trying to chase the regular season win totals to get a high seed as possible, that's a good thing. So that's what I was going to kind of allude to before you uh, said it for me, that the, the, there are some guys with contracts, whether they're on the Cavs or any of the 30 teams in the NBA, that do have prerequisites or bonuses in their contracts, or maybe there's escalators that level up how much money they make based on like a, awards or... Uh, all NBA standings or things like that. Um, even all star consideration could be a factor too. And if you play more games, especially against higher level opponents that also have their entire squad available, make a more compelling argument to do that. Um, and I, I think, yeah, like you said, like the political answer, the the proper answer to say is, yeah, I want to play in every game, but you obviously can't predict injuries or things like that. Um, but like for the Cavs, I, I don't know if I fully agree about chasing the regular season. Like if there's a point we realize, okay, we're only going to finish like the third or fourth best record in the Eastern Conference and they're kind of locked into that. Maybe they find creative ways to give guys rest when they can. And that's the back sure. end of it. Really. Like, how can the Cavs maybe afford ways to rest their guys so they're not completely burnt out come postseason time, especially depending on who they draw come playoff time as well. But yeah, you want to be as competitive as possible. We'll talk about the midseason tournament and like odds with it later in the week. Um, and maybe this plays a little bit of an impact in it too, just because now like those mid-season tournament games for the standings like the Cavs, you have to play the Sixers and the Hawks. Those games are now on technically national TV. And that means that the Cavs, unless there's like a serious pre-existing injury to like James Harden, Joel Embiid, DeJounte Murray, or Trey Young, the guys that are on the opponents for in terms of quote unquote star designation list, um, like the Cavs are going to see the very best from some of these teams that they will be jockeying and fighting with, not just for the mid-season tournament, but the Eastern Conference conference standings as well and it, it, sure it's easier it's earlier in the season so maybe you don't have a full feel or depth or appreciation especially if like a team like philly that could make a move leading up to the deadline especially with james harden but it at least is a good filling out process and also maybe some validation on the moves we made this offseason certainly did help us level up to hang up hang out hang with some of the teams that we're fighting with in the east or maybe we're trying to like distance ourselves from and show that we're better than yeah, I I think the the point about the regular season, I think that chasing wins, you'll hit a point in maybe like March where like you do slow it down a little bit, but I think until then I would suspect foot on the gas to some degree. It's where I think this ends up. All right, coming up next, we're going to look at it. do we like this? Do we like that this is a policy? We're just going to debate the merits of it. That's going to be coming up next. Today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel, the official sports book of Locked On and America's number one sports book. So get going with the NFL season with incredible offers from FanDuel. Right now, new customers can bet $5 and get 200 in bonus bets back, guaranteed. Plus, all customers who bet $5 will get $100 off NFL Sunday ticket from YouTube and YouTube TV. 
So now is the best time to join FanDuel. The app is easy to use. and You can bet on everything from spreads to player props and more. There are tons of NBA odds as well. We're going to be talking about some of them as they relate to the Cavs later this week. So stay tuned for that. So right now, visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and kick off the NFL season with offers you won't want to miss. Visit again, FanDuel.com backslash locked on to get that offer. And that's FanDuel, an official partner of the NFL. All right. Evan, do you like this policy, just as it, that it exists? Do you like the fact that this is now something that has been codified into league rules? I think it's interesting because you, you talked about like a team like the Clippers or even you look at the Suns, a team that does have guys that struggle with health consistency, especially Kevin Durant, just because he is still kind of fighting back from that Achilles tear. But like I'm looking at the lens of a cat of the Cavs or just like in terms of just competitive, meaningful basketball, it makes it a lot more fun because the NBA has tried to find solutions to existing issues. I think flattening the lottery odds certainly fixed a lot of the tanking problems just because we see teams like Memphis get John Morant or the Pelicans get Zion Williamson and the Lakers jump up into the top four to get Anthony Davis. Um, or you see teams now that are like, okay, we're going to like rest guys on meaningful games. And like, if you look at it from a Cavs lens, I remember when the Mavericks didn't play Luca when the Mavericks were in town. And I don't think Dallas against Cleveland is on national TV this year, but like now, at least if you're a fan and you're like, this is your one shot, your one opportunity, the only chance you have to be able to afford tickets to go to a game and you want to see Luca because one, you might be a Cavs fan, but Luca's your favorite player. Like you at least have the added insurance or luxury in the back of your mind, knowing that yeah, there's a very, very good chance that I will see Luca Doncic play against my hometown team. And I don't have to like drive or fly or travel to Dallas or anything like that in order to make that happen. So like that's a win in that regard for the fans. Um, again, I, I like you, I'm curious to see how the players feel about it. It's certainly, codified into the new CB, the new collective bargaining agreement. And Donovan Mitchell's one is like the V one of the VPs of the players association. So I think he's probably comfortable with it if you did ask him, but I think it's going to be a bit of a feeling out process. I think it's going to be an understanding thing. I wonder how strictly and how harshly does the NBA enforce some of these rules and policies? Like what if it's just like freak accidents or something like that, or the sequel to COVID happens like that. I'm sure there's something written in deeper in the codified laws and stuff with it, but I'm interested to see how teams that are usually organizations that deal with players that have health concerns navigate this. And also how bought in are all the players from all 30 teams, not just for like the financials of the award aspect of it, but can they physically handle an 82 game grind in a much more physical NBA or do we just, I don't know, like it makes it fun that the regular season's more fun. I think the in season tournament certainly helps with that too. This just further drives the point home that like from game one to game 82, things are certainly going to be interesting no matter who is playing, whether it's on national TV, local broadcasts, or just anything come playoff time. Like there's going to be competitive basketball regular season long. That's just, that's just how my feelings, but I, I want to know how everyone else feels about it and how like the general reception is to it. Like when we get 20, 30 games into the season, we're starting to get into the bit of the grindy part of it when it's like late December, early January. And some teams are still trying to like play themselves back into like a gel or groove. And then you have the other team start to flame out and things like that. Like there's a lot of things that have always just happened that may change because of this. And I'm, I'm curious to see how, like what has become routine uh, stops being routine. The first thing that I, I will say in, in positive about it, because I, I, I am, there are things about it that I'm unsure about where they're going to go. But I think number one, I, I do like that the teams are being fined and not players. Hundred thousand yeah. dollars for the first time, two hundred fifty thousand for the second, one point two five million for the third, and then an additional one million fine more than the previous fine for every violation after that. It's like you, if you do this a bunch and you don't take this seriously, you're going to bite it. And I like that it's not the players. I like that it's the owners. I like that it's the teams because. I do think this has more been a team, data scientist team, medical staff team organization thing about guys not playing more than it is the players. I all the the what I don't, what I tend to think I I, I don't know exactly how this is going to be enforceable. Um, I I think that's where the tricky part of this is is going to be, like load management. I think has worked and it makes sense for some guys. I think we've also already seen guys 
be really the teams have skirted this. Like you've seen Drew Holiday check in and then foul and check out. Bam Adebayo played like eight minutes in a game and then mm-hmm. left. Like this has been skirted. So is that going to be done aggressively? What is the punishment for that? And I think ultimately this this isn't about like and in, in, in a way that I understand and I'm sympathetic to, but it also just like it's this isn't like necessarily a basketball thing they're trying to fix. This is a business thing. This is a TV rights thing. This is a trying to push live events. Like that's what this is. That that's what this is. And I think if you want to have some trepidation about that, that this is really like a money thing more than it is a let's make the game better thing. And maybe it, the one does lead to the other. I'm, I think that's probably part of the argument the league is going to make about this and has made. I kind of just think this is that more than it is like a real basketball thing. I mean, I think it goes part and parcel with it, where if the product's more competitive, it's much more entertaining, it's much more compelling. You're going to see a lot more top flight investors. And I mean, the NBA is like a multi-billion, trillion dollar entity already. Like they have Nike, they have Coke, they have Ruffles, they have like everything, everything is sponsored, everything is affiliated. And like I, I you've even it's that way in every sport, like the halftime show or the review for a possible penalty in the NFL is sponsored by something now. Like there's product placement no matter where you go. But like if you're the NBA and you're like renegotiating these contracts or things like that, you're like, oh, well, the product's much more viable. It's much more competitive. It's much more entertaining compared to like another multi-billion dollar entity like the NCAA where like they make BOGO bucks um, come March Madness time. Whereas the NBA is like, well, you could have all that money like in a condensed like cup multi-week format where you can invest even more in a equally or even more competitive and exciting product. Um, I don't know. I think they go hand in hand with each other. I do wonder how much is it capitalism? How much is it just trying to make the product more enjoyable for the fans itself? I think they all kind of blur together at the end of the day too. But it's, uh, again, I I am intrigued by it. And let me ask you this at just face value. Like, how do you, like, are you a fan of this? Are you looking forward to this? Are you kind of like me? You're like, I want to see what the general response is not at the beginning of the season or before it's really executed, but a quarter of the way, or maybe even a third of the way into the season. I think it's generally good. I just think I'm, there's some skepticism, right? Like I, I think, I think this is ultimately like a good thing because I, I do think, People, I think if we're if you're gonna live in this world where people are gonna pay tons and tons of money to go to games, and like, look, the Cavs are not immune to this. I don't think any NBA team is. The, the cost you go to games is stupid high. To go to a game, to buy four tickets, if you go with your family, to go with a partner, to get food, to buy beer, to buy game, to buy merch, it is stupid expensive to go to games. So if if I'm the league. And I want to like make sure people are going to keep spending lots of money for tickets. I probably want to make sure the players are going to be there. I also, again, think that the players, based on what we know, are not the ones who've been like, yeah, let me sit out a bunch. No, um, unless like... That- and unless like I don't know, you have nothing to play for, or like the only way a player wants to sit out is like maybe we see something happen with James Harden in this Philly saga, or what happens with Damian Lillard in Portland if the Blazers don't trade him or a team like it said Toronto is a place he wouldn't want to play for. But if he like ends up at the, with the Raptors or something like that, like maybe that's the way to navigate it. And like, that's the interesting thing too, is like you said, like organizations and owners get fined for players sitting out. Like when does this come into consideration when a player like forcefully sits themselves out because they don't want to play a risk injury because they're in a situation they don't want to be in? Like, where does that come into play as well? Like there's a lot of things where like, isn't fully answered that I think the NBA will have to like calcify and find an answer for, because there are factors that also are in play for guys not playing. I think there's going to be a lot that we don't know. I reckon if you want some reading about this, Danny Chow um, at The Ringer wrote a really good blog about this. The piece is called The NBA's New Rest Policy is Built on a House of Cards. And I think it goes at a point that I think is correct, that it kind of points at that like the game has changed somewhat. And this is kind of papering over maybe a bigger problem that the league and teams are facing. So I recommend go read that piece. It's at The Ringer. I'll put it in the show notes as well. Um, but think about this 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 is the kind of if you want to get abstract about this and you want to think about where your team your favorite team is going and how it's going to affect them this is the kind of stuff you should i think be engaging with mentally and uh, this is not going to stop 
anytime soon, I don't think. All right, coming up next, how other team how, could this give the Cavs any kind of advantage? Evan's going to lead a little discussion on that. All right, bring us in, Evan. Where where do you want to start with with this? So I didn't catalog this in terms of national TV games, but there is an interesting argument because I do think of that Luca situation where it made headlines uh, online, at least, and it certainly was a talking point by the end of the game because things certainly crystallized on a national level. But like, how do teams navigate this in terms of just like opponents the Cavs face? And I like looked at all. I was wrong. 26 teams, 25, not including the Cavs that are impacted by these new rules and coding. And these are based on like star players that are on the roster. Maybe guys that aren't available. And again, like players can jump out like Damian Lillard could join the Raptors and they have two guys on their roster or like Lillard joins the magic or gosh, like the Detroit Pistons somehow. And like they suddenly enter the fray and then the Portland Trailblazers just dip out because of it. Unless like the Blazers get like an all-star or a former all-star level player in the process. But if you like look at how it's structured, the Cavs, are pretty equally faced in terms of just like rest and just how they face certain opponents like Atlanta. Um, there's an instance where like Atlanta's on the second game of back to back. The Cavs are on a second game of the back to back. Once the Hawks are three times and they face them. So like the Cavs have rest advantage on that one or like Brooklyn, it, it's split down the middle. Like the Cavs have a second game of back to back. And then the final game of the season, the Nets are on a second game of the back to back. And then like you look at like much more competitive matchups, like, I don't know, like the Lakers, like that's not a national TV game, but I'm sure there's going to be implications to it. Like the Cavs on the first game of back-to-back when they host the Lakers at home, then they host the Raptors the following night. And then the more interesting one for me is towards the, is our, I put this in wrong. It's um, April 6th. Um, like the Lakers on the first game of back-to-back where they host the Timberwolves the following day. But the Cavs are technically on the first game of back-to-back because they're at home or they're in Los Angeles for the second night in a row against the Clippers on April 7th. So like there's certain ways that this is, can be tackled. Um, again, I wish I had noted more of the national TV games, but like if you look at like playoff caliber opponents or like the end season tournaments and like those are national TV games for sure. Like, the Cavs and Sixers both have like their back-to-back structured in a way where like there's not going to really be opportunities to rest your guys. Like the Cavs face the Heat immediately after they play the Sixers on November 21st um, at home. So like I don't know how many opportunities are going to be allowed to rest their guys against Philly if they want to have more guys available or healthier guys against Bam and Jimmy and maybe even Dame if they get him. Whereas the Sixers have to face the Timberwolves the following night, and which is no easy task either. And then you look ahead, like the Sixers are coming off a game at home against the Knicks on February 23rd. And then the Cavs are at home against Orlando when they face each other when they're in Philadelphia. Um, like there's a lot of interesting ways that this can be tackled. And then I don't know, like there's even teams like the Clippers who got a little bit more of a benefit just because like they have no back to back opportunities with the Cavs are stuck in that weird, like two days and two nights, uh, back to back situation in Los Angeles. Like they, uh, they, 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 the Cavs have a little bit of a more difficult schedule at times just because in like some of these like road trips are just like weird beginnings and ends of the season are now a little bit more punctuated and accentuated just by um, how these new rules are in place and whether or not like, the Cavs can have like realistically rest any of their guys. They, they, they can't obviously, but um, it's just, it's a weird more difficult way to navigate things just based on who Cleveland is facing the following night. And like that has an implication of it being like a national TV game somehow. And that That's the other thing is like later in the season, stuff can get flexed to ESPN at any time or TNT at any time as well. I, I just look at the list of guys that are eligible, Evan, and I just think the Cavs have one of the easier ways to navigate this. Like, I would much rather have Cleveland's guys that are 27 and under in this policy and Garland and Mitchell and Allen than, like, like, I, like, like LeBron having to be subject to this is probably going to create some real headaches for the Lakers. See, that, that's, LeBron, that's what I think of. Like, that's going to probably create some friction for the Lakers and the NBA at times. Yeah, you can, Devin Book in Phoenix... Kevin Durant has had like real injury concerns. He's 35 years old. Mm-hmm. Like there, there are situations where like the Warriors are as an older group of guys. Like they have five there are gonna, on their list. They have five on their list, and like Curry is older. Thompson is older and has had two catastrophic injuries. Draymond Green is older. Chris Paul is the oldest of them, and he's new to that. Like there are there are things here that are going to be really tricky to navigate. I don't think the Cavs have like something where like it wouldn't surprise me. 
if this plays out for Cleveland, where we talk about it on the media day, it maybe comes up once or twice. Let's say like Donovan Mitchell turns his ankle in, in November and it's not super bad and he plays through it. And we ask like, hey, did the, like just ask him point blank, like, you know, ask JB like, hey, did the rest policy impact your decision to play tonight? Like, was that part of this? But I think with other teams, it might come up a lot more. Like, New Orleans, Lord, I, I don't know what's going to happen with Zion's body. You know how hard that is to navigate? If you're, again, the Lakers, the Clippers, like, all these are really, really hard to navigate in a way that I don't think they are for Cleveland. So if you wanted to tell yourself that there's something of an advantage for that for Cleveland, then I would probably be willing to believe it just because there's not a track record of these guys needing to miss a bunch of time or having been, you know, really impacted by this policy before this. Or we didn't even mention other teams too, like Milwaukee, like Giannis, he could try and find opportunity. He had to find opportunities to rest him. Chris Middleton is still kind of coming back from being iffy last season after dealing with some injuries the season prior to that, or like Drew Holiday is like, eh, for me, like it raised an eyebrow and I saw Mike Conley technically qualified with the Timberwolves because of his time with the uh, Jazz. Was he an all-star with the Jazz or the Grizzlies in his last season? Uh, I think think the Grizzlies as a Mike Conley like official as like someone who loves Mike Conley and like thinks about Mike Conley more than I like you know there's that Roman Empire me and I think about Mike Conley like some of these weirdos think about the Roman Empire okay so it was Utah in 2020 2021 so what's Utah it wasn't he never made one for Memphis that's actually a really good trivia question it is a good trivia question because yeah the Mike Conley Utah years kind of feel like a blur just COVID does ruin all this, but like Mike Conley is a guy who is an older player and like, isn't like a key integral piece to the Timberwolves. Like, will there be nights he plays? Well, the Wolves have to find ways to make sure he's available for national TV games or games that have like a meaning and consequence. So like, like that's tricky. Uh, LaMelo, like Charlotte, um, they have LaMelo ball on this list and like the, the Hornets aren't going to be good next season. Like I'm very firm and comfortable in saying that. And like, do the Hornets want to find a way to maybe like, jockey and uh better stand their lottery odds but they have to navigate a way to like play competitive basketball with the mellow ball and um just everything that they're doing over there in terms of their rebuild right now like that's gonna be tough for like golden state's the hardest one because like that's a huge national street tv draw and you have guys that are older like you said like steph curry like clay thompson is coming off catastrophic injuries draymond green is or has catastrophic injuries in his injury history draymond green is an older player chris paul being the oldest of the bunch and being on the list it's just so interesting to me just because of the bounce back he had with the thunder and then that brief like renaissance period with the suns before they punted him for bradley beal um there's just a lot of interesting ways that things can go work out like does fred van fleet even play like the entirety of his contract with houston i don't know but the rockets gotta find creative ways to have him available and on the floor especially if like yeah, they're trying to be more competitive under Udoka, but like they need to find ways to maybe improve in terms of this weird youth development program that they're doing too. Like, there's a lot of interesting stuff, and like I didn't even think of Zion with the Pel- Zion with the Pelicans. Like, does that fall under the Damian Lillard situation, or does that fall under like his health and rehabilitation? Because he is such an odd, interesting case because of his just physical setbacks in terms of just his size and explosiveness and just like where the pelicans are at comfortable comfortability wise in terms of health and availability or just like the whispers and rumors of him wanting out of new orleans end up being true and he that forces his way out of there by not playing like there's a lot of ways that the pelicans have to tackle this too and then finally um from the Cavs, like you said like they are a team that airs on the side of caution in terms of player rest and well-being and just health um are they afforded and allowed that luxury where they can let a guy like Donovan Mitchell maybe tweak his ankle, like take a game or two off, and especially in terms of like back to backs or uh, games that could be implicated on like national TV? Like, can the Cavs afford that? Maybe do they have to swallow a hundred thousand dollar pill every now and then when that happens, or just based on their infractions and the intensity of the infractions, like the, the, the prices escalate? But like, it's going to be an interesting navigation and I'm just more so curious. And it's the same thing when we talked about the new CBA is like, how do teams maybe or organizations rather find the loopholes and ways to exploit these new rules so that they can shape the game more so in their favor and what they just have available in terms of just like assets, player personnel and things like that. Yeah, I don't, I don't, I think the fines are big enough where teams are just not going to mess around. You think so? I think they're, I don't know, Steve Ballmer's worth so much money. I feel like Steve Ballmer would just scream developers and sweat through four shirts and then pay the $100,000 fine. Then just like, eh, whatever. 
Okay, but it's a hundred thousand, and then it escalates. Like maybe you pay it once, but you're not paying it more than that. Okay, that okay. Balmer again, I think it would go more than once, but like most owners probably aren't wanting to just drop a hundred k because some of their guys needed the night off. Like it's going to be an interesting argument and conversation because again, how do the players feel about it? Like, do they want to really put their bodies and grind them into the dust like this? Or do they want to afford ways to catch their breath and make their overall season and just long-term health uh, more conducive and positive for them? All right. Well, in there, I'm Chris Manning. That's Evan Darrell. Thanks again to Jake Stevens for production. Thanks again to FanDuel for sponsoring the show. Back at you tomorrow with more Lockdown Gaps.